Um, so I want to welcome you all to our last single cell short talk session here at Bioc 2023. I'm Wes. I'm a tumor immunologist and computational biologist at Penn Medicine. And I have the privilege of sharing this session. And Tim will be moderating the online chat room. Speakers will have nine minutes to talk with one minute of questions. If you have any questions you want to ask anonymously here, you can put them in the Q&A tab on Hopin. Uh, you can remote or local. Um, if you, when you get to about one minute left, I'll be sitting over there, speakers. I'll raise my hand to give you a one minute warning. Um, if you go over your one minute time, I'm going to start shouting out philosophical questions at you. Um, are humans innately good or evil? Does it matter if we're alive? Uh, if your package isn't on CRAN, does it exist? Um, speakers should feel free to stay at this podium and answer questions while the questions are happening. I will come up, stay here. I'm just going to be putting on the next presenter slides. I felt like some people in other sessions felt like I was kicking them out. I wasn't. I was just trying to get the next presenter going. Um, so with that, with that said and out of the way, I'd like to welcome up our first speaker um, from the Guta University and the University Hospital of Frankfurt and the Neurological Institute. Please welcome Ahmed Ilajam. Hopefully I didn't do terrible. His talk is Unraveling Immunogenic Diversity in Single Cell Data. All right. Um, well, thank you for the introduction. Um, yep. Uh, so yeah, have you ever wondered how uh, integrative single cell methods commonly used deal with immune genes that are hyper polymorphic and polygenic? No? Well, the answer is simple. <laughs> well, the answer is simple. They do not. Um, so in this talk, we will learn how these two characteristics can be better addressed. Uh, so first, it is essential to understand that structural diversity of receptors is necessary to coordinate antigen-specific immune responses. Uh, so we can see here a T-cell receptor uh, that recognizes antigens presented either by MHC class 1 or MHC class 2 molecules. Uh, this is followed by different immune responses as we, uh, as we see here and as illustrated. What I show here is a single molecule with one particular structure. Uh, but, it is, but it's clear that this molecule needs to be that structurally diverse to be able to recognize a wide variety of antigens. Uh, so there are different genetic mechanisms to ensure that such structural diversity is established. And here I only focus on only two of them. The first one is polygeny, where multiple similar genes uh, encode the same or similar function. In this case, uh, we, we take immunoglobulin genes as an example. So during the VJ recombination process, uh, different constant segments of an antibody's light chain can come together or can be used in the transcripts. They all fulfill the same structure, but they just have a slightly different sequences. In most cases, one doesn't really care which of the genes it is. The numbers we see here in the table are relatively low, of uh, number of similar genes are relatively low, and they're easy to handle. The second mechanism is hyperpolymorphism, which is where we have multiple alleles for one particular gene. And we can see here in this figure that, uh, well, this is a, the representation of diversity um, on, a new, on a sequence based level of MHC molecules. Uh, the red color here basically represents substitutions of uh, nucleotide sequences that lead to antibody exchanges. And we can see that the, the majority of this red color is actually in the antigen binding cleft, uh, which further highlights that these molecules that are designed in this way to be diverse, to recognize a wide variety of antigen peptides. Uh, we can see here in the table now that uh, it, uh, things are getting uh, more complicated and the numbers here are relatively high. Uh, so these two mechanisms, as one can imagine, create uh, are bioinformatically challenging. Uh, in a typical transcriptomic analysis workflow, uh, things get complicated in terms of immunogenomics exactly at the step where uh, we start mapping reads to a reference genome to like learn which gene or transcript this read originated from. Why this is the case? Because this well creates a uh, bioinformatic challenge here. In this case, is cross mapping, where we start seeing uniquely mapped reads, but unfortunately to the wrong gene. So what are we going to do about this? Well, in this slide, I will discuss the implementation of allele and functional information. Uh, let's take this example where we have two genes, A1 and A2, and these are like uh, very similar genes. They are a representation of what I just mentioned, the polygenic and hyperpolymorphic immune genes. What we want to do is build a multi-layer data structure of immune gene expression on three levels. First, the allele level, the gene level, and the functional level. 
You might be familiar, and I'm pretty sure you are, with the gene level as it's implemented in the single cell experiment object at the moment. But what we want to add to that is two, two layers, the allele level and the functional level. What does that mean exactly? So on the allele levels, the alleles would be separate. So we would have a count uh, per allele per cell. And then on the gene levels, as you know it, these alleles would be summarized into a gene feature. So we would bring them together, and then we would have one number to that. We also mentioned the polygeny where multiple uh, genes encoding the same or similar protein uh, or similar function. Well, this is exactly what the functional level is for. So for example, all genes that encode an antibody's light chain can be summarized in the functional level into one feature. So we then try to summarize all of those alleles into one feature. So how do we do that? <clears throat> Well, we developed a workflow uh, to detect allele-specific expression of immune genes in human single-cell RNA-seq data, uh, both uh, with targeted sequencing and whole transcriptome. Uh, so let's take uh, this targeted sequencing example uh, at first. Uh, so when looking only at the gene level, we can see that the expression of HLAC, in this case in patients with uh, multiple myeloma, seems to be highly and similarly expressed in all eight patients, right? Uh, so our workflow consists now of two steps. Uh, first, we want to do allele typing, and then uh, to like know which alleles actually belong to this particular gene. And then we want to quantify uh, the expression of those alleles. So among others, uh, we were able to detect these two alleles, as I show here, uh, that were reliably and accurately expressed in certain patients, as we, as we see. Uh, the basic underlying concept of that is donors uh, having a donor-specific reference. This helps us to avoid quantification bias to a certain extent, and it allows us also to quantify allele expression. One benefit of this is imagine if we had either one of the two alleles in the reference, then this provides inaccurate interdonor comparability, where in one patient, HLAC would seem highly expressed and then low in the other. This is the case, for example, of people coming from different ethnicities and having different alleles. The second example is now talking about whole transcriptome uh, data sets. Well, similarly in here, we uh, in a whole transcriptome data set of PBMC from one donor, we can see that HLAC seems to be uh, highly expressed in almost all cell types. However, when performing allele typing on HLAC, we see that certain populations, especially here, express only one of the two alleles. This level of information could not be observed and cannot be observed when, only when looking at the gene level expression. Another benefit of this is that, uh, well, imagine the case again where we have different HLA alleles for the same genes fulfilling different functions such as antigen presentation. Now imagine that only one of those two alleles can present an important antigen to a particular T cell. Well, then different regulatory and evolutionary mechanisms would enable this exact one allele to be up or down regulated compared to the other one. Uh, we So at this, I mentioned allele typing, then I also want to mention just one line about quantification. We do quantification here using alignment-free tools. They, they, they are fast, accurate, and resource-friendly. So in the last part, I want to introduce our upcoming single-cell allele experiment package and explain how we implement this as a bioconductor package. Inspired by single-cell experiment, if it's not clear by the name, well, inspired by that and to take full advantage of all the great perks that come along with it, we want to extend the package to include allele information of, gene, uh, of genes of interest. By genes of interest, this will be something inputted by the user. So they would choose, they would give us a list of genes that they want to do allele typing for and, and uh, quantification. Uh, having this uh, level of information, we then develop uh, what we have here, so the gene level and the allele uh, and the functional level, and we have them all in one matrix as we see here. Uh, downstream analysis can then be performed as we also see here on any of those three levels. So you can have three, let's say, kind of different angles of the same problem. You can do clustering and all the dimension reduction on either the allele level, the gene level, or the functional level. So then one question is, how do, you, how do we even construct those, uh, you know, the gene and functional features from the allele, uh, feature, uh, from the allele level? Where, and, how, and also how to tell like bioconductor functions which level of information to use, the allele, the gene, or the, function, uh, or the functional level. We do this uh, through a meta metadata or like a lookup table uh, that we create using the allele information. And uh, so basically it has three columns. It says like which allele belongs to which gene and to which functional level or class, like HLA class one or HLA class two. 
In summary, uh, cross-mapping is problematic for many immune genes, and I would have loved to discuss that more, but due to time constraints, I think you'll just believe me by saying that. Uh, the benefit of using allele, uh, we also showed that the benefit of using allele-specific quantification, this also, on top of what I mentioned, gives us valuable insights into why specific human groups or populations are disproportionately impacted by a particular disease, especially in the case where a disease impacts one particular allele or sequence with a mutation. Uh, we, I also showed you our, the multi-layer data structure for precise quantification of immune gene expression in single cell data at the allele gene and functional level. And last but not least, I want to thank our project partner, Federico uh, Marini in Mainz, Germany. I also want to thank my PI, of course, uh, Dr. Katharina Imkeller, and also our master's students, Jonas, who contributed uh, a lot to this project. So, uh, And also, of course, our great funders and all of that. So thanks to everybody. Any questions? Oh, so we got one online okay. from Raymond Koreshi. We have a question online from Raymond Koreshi. It says, when will this package be available? Is there a development version available on GitHub? Um, unfortunately, not yet, uh, but it's uh, it should be coming this year. So in the next, hopefully, two or three months, we want to start writing the manuscript and try to submit this as a like the manuscript by the end of the year. Um, so hopefully soon. Great talk. So when you're trying to group the genes to the functional level, I get with the MHCs and the T cells, it's relative and BC, B cell receptors, it's really easy to find similar genes. Yes. But what if you're like going to the whole genome, is there like a data set that you can use to like make those functional groupings? Um, I, I'm not sure to be honest. So the, the focus will be, or like, the, Hope, so our kind of like target audience are immunologists who want to, you know, show like who want to learn more about those MAC molecules and immunoglobulins and all those uh, immune genes with uh, these two specific characteristics. In principle, this could be done uh, at least on an allelic level to all the whole transcriptome. On a functional level, to be honest, I have to think like we have to think about it to know like which genes could fit within the same function. Uh, yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. But thanks for asking. So one more, one more follow-up. Um, you mentioned reference-free methods for quantification, which seemed like a terrific idea, especially when focusing on, say, HLA and Kier. Yes. Um, how does that work out in terms of managing the sort of combinatorial explosion of alleles that can be seen uh, across uh, across groups of genes when you're visualizing them? I, I assume that you were using something like IC for the allelic visualization. Are, are there any problems that arise when, when doing that, or is it just a non-issue in practice? Uh, so we haven't really uh, found any issues with that so far. We, we're using at the moment Callisto for quantification. Uh, but we also want to benchmark to Salmon and others to see what uh, gives us like better or best representation. And you're absolutely right. So that's where Federico's uh, also help comes uh, in this project. So he's one of the co-authors of IC. So we also want to implement this uh, in the IC Shiny app for visualization purposes. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think so. What we found is that like with the with the, after doing allele typing is that the expression really seems to be highly and reliably expressed in the patients we do allele typing in. So I don't really see a problem with when, you know, looking at that in uh, in IC and other shiny app packages. But I hope it, it goes smoothly. I mean, at least for now, it, we, we didn't have any issues. So thank you again. Thank you. Our second speaker is a PhD student from the Department of Biostatistics at Harvard University. Please welcome Philip Nicole and his talk, Model-Based Dimensional Reduction for Single-Cell RNA-Seq with Generalized Bilinear Models. Uh, uh, hi, guys. Um, so I'm sure everybody here uh, would agree that dimension reduction is a, a critical step in the analysis of, of single-cell RNA-Seq data. Um, for instance, it occurs upstream of many important steps, such as clustering, trajectory inference, visualization, et cetera. And the standard approach is to 
you know, apply some transformation to the count matrix and then to take that transform count matrix and apply PCA. And the goal here is that you should be removing all sources of unwanted variability that could bias the results of PCA. However, um, some existing literature has shown that, you know, some of the most commonly used transformations can actually fail in this step. Um, so I really like this plot because it shows that you can start with a, a count distribution that, you know, looks relatively homogenous across cells. And then upon applying the standard log transformation, you end up with a sort of a very large spike at zero and a gap between the zero reads and the non-zero reads. And sort of, you know, PCA will pick up on that sort of um, artificially introduced variance. And then you'll end up with, you know, PCs that are strongly correlated with the number of zero reads per cell, even on, on negative control data. Um, so instead of sort of a two-step approach to dimension reduction, a more principled approach might be to simultaneously model the count distribution of the data while also modeling how the latent effects uh, impact the mean of that count distribution. And that's what we've sort of set out to do with our, our model slash R package that we call SCGBM. Um, so specifically, we model each entry of the count matrix with a Poisson distribution with some mean, mu ij. And then we assume that the log of that mean is equal to the sum of these three matrices. Um, the alpha are the gene-specific intercepts. The beta are cell-specific intercepts, similar to, to size factors or offsets. And then the, the U sigma V transpose are the latent factors. So the U are the, the gene-specific loadings, and the V are the cell-specific scores. Um, you know, those of you who are familiar with uh, GLMPCA, um, well, it turns out that this is actually the same underlying model as, um, as GLMPCA. But sort of SCGBM was set out to sort of address sort of key, some key limitations of the software. Um, firstly, it doesn't scale well to, to very large data sets. It can take days and days to run on, on data sets with millions of cells. Um, there has been, you know, several um, papers have noted that there are some convergence issues. And then also, it doesn't do uncertainty quantification in the low dimensional embedding. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. Um, but I just wanted to show like a quick toy example um, that we came up with that shows an example where SCGBM captured, you know, latent variability that, that transformation based, based approaches missed. Um, so in this like very simple simulation, there are just three cell types. Um, each cell type is distinguished by a single marker gene. So cell type A is overexpressing gene one, cell type B is overexpressing gene two. All the rest of the genes are just random noise. And it turns out that, you know, two of the leading methods based on transformations, SC transform and the log transform, are sort of unable to, you know, capture this very simple latent variability, whereas SCGBM uh, is able to. Um, this is just a plot showing that, you know, on simulated data with a known ground truth, um, you know, both in terms of like R squared with the, the true factor and RMSE, uh, SCGBM is outperforming GLMPCA. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we actually fit the model. Um, so on medium-sized data sets, we designed a new um, iteratively reweighted singular value decomposition algorithm that can be used to fit the model, um, but it's only applicable to, to medium-sized data sets. Um, for, for large data sets, we recommend using something that we called the projection method. And the, the idea is very simple. It's just to use a smaller subset of the cells to fit your gene-specific loadings, and then to project, to, to estimate V conditional on you by sort of projecting the remaining cells um, onto that basis. And the, the key is that this projection step can be accomplished by, by fitting GLMs in parallel. Um, so actually in a, a very large data set with, with 1.3 million cells, we, we were able to fit the whole model in just uh, uh, 55 minutes. Um, yeah, and here I'm just showing that like, if all you want is the dominant factors, then the projection method is quite an accurate approach. As you increase the subset fraction, you get better and better 
you know, the, the projection method is better able to reconstruct the dominant factors in the data. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is um, the uncertainty quantification. Um, so because SCGBM is a model-based approach, you can quantify uncertainty in all the parameters, including the low dimensional embedding. And you can do this just using the classical method of, of inverting the, the Fisher information matrix. And, you know, when we, one reason that we thought like uncertainty quantification, you know, might be useful is sort of to test, you know, how stable a given cell clustering is. So here, what I've done is I just generated IID Poisson noise. I plugged it into Surat and told it to cluster my data. And it found six clusters, all of which we know cannot be real because this data is completely null. Um, however, you know, upon drawing sort of confidence intervals around each point, we see that, you know, all the clusters are sort of overlapping, which should tell us that, you know, we shouldn't really have much faith in this clustering that Surat gave us. Um, you know, this is very qualitative, but we tried to make it a little more quantitative by defining what we called uh, a cluster confidence index. And it's basically the probability that two cells in the same cluster would still be um, in the same cluster under, you know, repeated sampling of the data. So for, for instance, uh, it ranges between zero and one and a cluster confidence index of 0.2 should indicate very low confidence um, in, in the particular clustering. Um, there's also like a two dimensional heat map version. So you can see what clusters are overlapping with, with other clusters. Um, you know, then when you, you know, apply it to some purified immune cells, and then you see what the, the CCIs are. Now they're much closer to, to one, um, which, you know, makes sense because in this case, we know there are sort of real clusters in this data. So it's telling us we should be very confident, for example, that the B cells are sort of a, um, a biologically distinct population. Um, yeah, so um, it's available. You can download this on GitHub. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of extensions that I'm really thinking about, one of which is extending to, to spatial transcriptomics by imposing some sort of spatial structure in the V matrix so that you can draw information across, across uh, sites or spots. And uh, I'd just like to thank my advisors, uh, Jeff Miller uh, and Rafael Zari, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for a great talk. Really interesting work, um, nice statistical work. I was curious to hear your thoughts on, um, uh, sometimes when I see like standard workflows like Surat, I guess one of their major features is that they z-score genes before doing, uh, before inputting them in the PCA, which tends to have the effect of sort of lessening the impact of highly expressed genes and sort of upping the impact of genes that may be kind of lowly expressed, but still have meaningful variability that define cell populations. When I've tried other count-based factorization approaches in the past, they seem to be more influenced by kind of the highly expressed genes with, with many counts. Like they're trying really strongly to fit kind of subtle variability up there and they, they miss kind of variability among the, the lower expressed genes. So I was just curious if you tried exploring your model and you know, does, can you still capture variability among genes that may have like lower counts or cell populations that are defined by those genes? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure you know, what particular software like has this problem, but sort of the whole goal of sort of the, the simultaneously modeling is that, you know, you're able to, you know, you know, normally you transform to stabilize the mean variance relationship, but here you're, you're, you're able to simultaneously model, you know, the mean variance relationship in the form of the Poisson distribution while also modeling the latent effects. So I would, Imagine that this model would resolve that issue um, and not sort of give preference. It shouldn't give preference to the baseline expression is what I would think. Um, but if you have like a particular example that's been problematic, I'd, I'd certainly be interested to, to try it on, on my implementation. Okay, sure. I'll tell you about it after. Great talk. I have two quick questions. The, the, the first is um, one, 
uh, surrounding the model that you've constructed and perhaps the ability to capture or at least uh, model false positives because a lot of these spatial data, especially the image-based approaches, do have false positives, which is something that is perhaps not as thought about as frequently in the actual sequencing methods. So you have these factors that are cell-specific, if I understand. Do you think that those could encapsulate aspects of counts that are detected in individual cells but that actually aren't really there? I see. Um, oh, so this is like, so some sort of failure of the technology means that you saw a count that, honestly, I, I'd have to think about it a little more. Um, yeah, I think that could be a fun thing to think yeah. about. I mean, it can happen in sequencing if, you know, you have leak through yeah. from genes from cells that are lysing, but mm -hmm. I wonder if embedded in this is a way to kind of gracefully incorporate the fact that there are legitimate false counts um, in some of these, uh, in some of these measurements. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I definitely have to think more, but I sort of see like the idea, like I'd be yeah, definitely interested in trying it. Yeah. I mean, this touches a little bit on the comment that was just made in the previous question. And in, in Murphy's data, when we have these type of false counts, sometimes we are careful in not applying Z-score in data sets that have slightly higher false positive rates because that tends to accentuate these false counts in what's driving, uh, you know, the major major factors in our PCs, and so we play that game um, in a very unsophisticated way, deciding how we choose to score uh, Z-score or not our data before we do a PC. Oh, uh, and so I think, you know, what what you're doing in terms of a model-based decomposition might have the capacity to handle that more gracefully than what we're currently doing. Yeah. And the second question, sorry, um, uh, to to ask a second one here is relating to your cluster confidence uh, intervals. I think this is a very, very nice idea. Can you look at which of your loadings are driving different elements of the uncertainty in clusters? And is that a way to get at um, perhaps underlying biological variability um, and, and perhaps extract more than just a sense of whether or not you've assigned a, a cluster label correctly, but perhaps what are the genes that are more or less informative to that? I see. Yeah, so the, the standard, so how we have it set up now is it's sort of like agnostic to the loadings you. You know, we're just imagining somebody has some labels, maybe it came out of thin air, and we just wanted to assess the stability of that. On the other end of the equation, though, you can also quantify uncertainty in the gene-specific loadings. And I think that would be, you know, important to sort of, you know, you know, finding signatures that sort of drive the particular factor or a particular biological process. So, yeah, I mean, it's implemented. We never did anything with uncertainty in the loadings, but mm. that would be interesting as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I think that, that's good. I have a question, but uh, I think for time we'll have to move forward. But I do want to talk to you later because that that last bit on cluster stability, I could really use some. If you add implement a way to easily embed those embeddings, that'd be in loadings, be really cool. I currently use Dune, which is like Hector and Kelly's package, and I take a side function of theirs to do it. But this could be really cool. All right. Just while he's uh, maybe pulling that up, I can go ahead and start with introducing myself. My name is Josh Campbell. I'm an associate professor at uh, Boston University. Uh, my lab focuses on novel statistical methods and factorization methods for single cell RNA-seq and mutational signature data. Uh, but we also develop uh, R packages and bioconductor packages uh, for uh, and toolkits for various uh, types of analyses. Um, so today I'm going to present to you one of our, our toolkits that we've developed, which is mBioconductor. Um, it's been uh, developed by a team of programmers, uh, Irza, Mich, and Nid, and Ali, all of whom who had previous engagements, so couldn't be here, so I'm, I'm just filling in for them, really, and, and taking credit for all of their awesome work. Um, so, of course, we all know that single-cell uh, data can be really powerful at capturing heterogeneity in complex biological systems. If you've ever done single-cell RNA-seq analysis, uh, you know, maybe starting from the counts after the, the data's been aligned and all the genes have been counted in each individual cell, uh, you may have used, you know, different tools, uh, depending on the types of analysis that you want to. These tools may be coming from different packages. 
Uh, they, you may have to switch between different uh, formats or data structures. Uh, you may even have to switch between different programming languages, depending on which tool you want to use. Uh, and a lot of times, you're probably making sort of your own custom slides to share the results and custom reports. Um, this can obviously be very time consuming. Uh, and you know everybody sort of has to go through the same thing. So um, everybody has those, uh, those limitations. What we've really tried to do is streamline the process by bringing a comprehensive set of tools underneath one umbrella. In this package we call single cell TK or single cell toolkit, uh, which I might just call SCTK for short uh, for the rest of the talk. So it's, um, it's an R bioconductor package uh, that unifies a bunch of different tools for doing a bunch of different analyses in one single common framework. Uh, you can see kind of list of tools and data structures that we support there in, in the cloud, and I'll talk a little bit more about them. Um, but not only do we provide access to the tools, we actually provide sort of three different ways to access them and use them. Um, you may be most familiar with like the, doing it on the console. So we have, of course, um, basically wrappers or uh, functions for each one of these tools to be able to run them. Uh, but we have an interactive Shiny app uh, for non-computational users to be able to run these tools. And um, uh, we also have a set of uh, R Markdown uh, reports that can quickly be generated from uh, the analysis that you do with the toolkit. Um, so the, this work has been uh, published in, in two, uh, two previous publications. First one was in Nature Communications. Uh, we're really focused on the comprehensive uh, QC. Um, so I'll talk a little bit of, about that. And then our second paper just came out yesterday, actually, in Cell Patterns, uh, which talks more about our interactive workflows in, within the Shiny app. Um, so starting off with, with the first part, comprehensive QC, um, there's kind of a general uh, workflow that uh, people should go through when they're uh, taking a look at their data. Um, the first step is usually some sort of empty drop detection, which is oftentimes done for you by tools like Cell Ranger. Uh, but once you get sort of your filtered matrix back, uh, you may do various things like doublet detection where you either flag cells as being potentially doublets or maybe even remove them in some cases. Another thing you might do is quantify the ambient RNA that's present uh, in uh, your data set and, and each one of your cells. Um, and, uh, oops, yeah, and there's a list of tools uh, that we support that can do each one of these, um, uh, these functions. Um, and then you might also generate other sort of general QC metrics like total number of UMIs and uh, percentage of mitochondrial uh, reads that you can use to sort of filter down your, your cells to your final set. Um, so um, yeah, we have a, a bunch of different options for each one of these, these steps uh, that you can uh, easily run. Uh, we also built uh, a pipeline, which we're calling SCTKQC. So this is a command line pipeline, which allows you to easily run these tools with a single command uh, on, on the CLI. So that way you can more quickly uh, do your QC uh, as a part of your sort of pre-processing uh, steps. And so this, uh, this pipeline can take input a bunch of different formats, including uh, Cell Ranger, Star Solo, Bus Tools, and so on, or uh, you know, individual file formats like AND data or a Surat object. Um, it'll import and convert those to a single cell experiment. It'll run all of the QC tools, um, depending on whether or not you're importing a, a raw matrix or a filter matrix, it'll run the, the correct set of tools. And then it'll export it to your format of choice. Um, we support several different formats, as well as make a bunch of different uh, QC plots in an HTML report. Um, so that way it's, um, it's easier to sort of get to the, the the results um, more quickly. And uh, we also have um, Terra implementations and um, implementations on Seven Bridges genomic clouds. So that way you can just really incorporate this into your pre-processing workflow uh, and get, uh, get your QC much more quickly. All right, just some examples of some of the plots and tables that it outputs. Um, of course, we all you know, make these sort of box plots or bubble plots looking at uh, individual samples and the quality control metrics um, uh, for each one. So on the top, showing you median counts detected per cell, the middle one is median features detected per cell, the bottom one is percentage of mitochondrial genes detected per, per cell. Here we're looking at four samples, uh, two different PBMC samples uh, uh, profiled with either the V2 or V3 versions of 10X uh, uh, protocols, um, and then aligned to two different uh, references, gen code V27 or V34. And we were just kind of curious to see the effects of these, these different things. Um, and we also output this table so that way you can see kind of the, the average uh, or the median numbers uh, for each QC metric for each sample really, really quickly. And so you don't have to make these tables yourself when you're showing your PI. It just, you just copy and paste it into your slides. So it saves you a little bit of time. 
Um, all right, so now jumping into the downstream stuff, that's QC and sort of upstream quality control. Now we're, um, we wanna do some analysis. So we have what we call an a la carte clustering workflow, which provides uniform access to tools from a bunch of different software packages uh, and environments. Um, and so, you know, the major steps in clustering of normalization, highly variable feature selection, scaling, dimensionality reduction, embedding and clustering. We try to incorporate as many tools from bioconductors as we can from like the skater, scrunan, uh, Scuttle packages. Uh, we have um, uh, the complete Surat workflow. So you can actually run Surat workflow using a single cell experiment object without ever having to manually convert to a Surat object. We do that all that for you back and forth underneath the hood. Um, uh, and so you can see all the different options that we have at each step. My, my favorite example, I wouldn't actually recommend doing this, but ScanPy actually re-implemented Surat's version of highly variable feature selection. So if you want to, you can call a Python re-implementation of an R function using an R bioconductor package. So it's sort of like a interoperability inception, I guess. So, um, um. All right, so now moving on to our app. So um, of course you can run all those things on the command line or on our console if that's what you want to do. Uh, but we also have an app which is available at sctk.bu.edu. Um, it shows you uh, some screenshots, kind of see the layouts where at the top you have sort of a, a menu bar where you can click on each one of your steps. Um, within each step you have uh, sort of the options over the left that you can select and the algorithm that you want to do as well as the plots on the right that show up um, with a lot of ability to customize each plot uh, as well as sort of like a wizard guide that tells you what you can do after you complete that step and takes you to the, to the next one. Um, in addition to our sort of a la carte workflow at the top we also have what we call curated workflows and this actually takes you through very specific, um, well-defined workflows. So if you just want to run the Surat workflow and you don't care about anything else, you can go click on our curated Surat flow here, workflow here. And then there's actually these like vertical blinds that sort of open up at each step. And so it'll take you through the exact Surat options. Um, you can recapitulate everything just by, you know, a point, this point and click GUI that you normally do with, with the Surat workflow. We also have ScanPy and then another tool that we developed called Zelda currently in there. And then uh, we have uh, several other downstream analyses that you can do or, or adjacent analyses that you can do, uh, various forms of like a fine marker analyses and specific differential expression, cell type labeling with single R, pathway enrichment analysis with GSBA and BAM, and trajectory analysis with, with T-SCAM. Um, just show you one example of kind of the interactivity, which can be useful. Uh, this is uh, our differential expression tab. Uh, where you know maybe you start off doing a fine marker analysis where it compares one cluster versus each other one and tries to find sets of genes, but oftentimes that doesn't work exactly the way you want it to. So you might want to compare specific clusters. What's cluster one and two versus three and four look like or something like that. And so this um, allows you to have a lot of flexibility in, in setting up your differential expressions. You can select clusters based on labels. Or you can manually input cells if you want to. Uh, various things um, and a, a lot of customization uh, with the heat map as well in terms of what annotations you want to display for cells or genes. Um, my, my last slide I'll talk about is the generation of HTML reports. Uh, this function we specifically generated just for our single cell core analyst um, who, uh, uh, who is handling about four to five projects any given week. Uh, and he also, you know, at various stages, he has to, you know, Normally he would make slides and update them each time and then send the slide deck and it just took a lot of time. We realized he was spending a lot of effort just making these slides over and over again. And so what we did is built this sort of a uh, R markdown template, which allows you to just quickly generate a report based off of a, a workflow or analysis that you've done. And then you can just share the, the whole HTML report with our, the collaborator, which the collaborators absolutely love it. Every time we don't give them a report, they complain and say, oh, hey, where's the report? We like that so much better because it, provides a lot of background and a lot of explanation over what's going on with the plots as well, which is hard to kind of fit in each slide, so. All right, so just to summarize, single cell TK is an R bioconductor package that unifies many different tools from different sources in a single framework. Comprehensive QC and analysis can be performed in the, performed in the R console, the command line, and cloud workflow, or in the interactive Shiny app. And then we generate these HTML reports, which can be used to quickly share uh, data between collaborators. So um, uh, thanks again to all the students who worked on this, as well as my collaborators, Evan Johnson and uh, Masano Yajima. So there, I'll go ahead and stop and see if we have time for questions. Thanks. Thank you.
one. Which you know, is also online, so I feel like covering my bases. Um, the usual filtering based on mitochondrial gene counts is an interesting quasi standard because for some cell types like cardiomyocytes, it's an absolutely terrible idea. Yeah. Um, Casey Green and Stephanie Hicks worked to, together to implement something called MIQC that doesn't seem to have been adopted as widely, but I wonder, is there any reason that this can't be you know, shoveled into this pipeline as something like a more sensible standard yeah. just using a mixture model for um, uh, nuclear transcripts and mitochondrial transcripts to, to sort of cut through that yeah that's a great question so I, yeah we didn't know about that tool that would be something that would be great to incorporate because incorporate because um we uh yeah the, with the framework in place it becomes very easy to sort of incorporate new tools it's really easy if it's a bioconductor package that already uses sce objects because then it's it's even uh less work for us but that's a great, a great example of something that could be added we don't. Yeah. We don't right. well, we went a little over. Flag Josh down, okay. okay. down later if you have a question in person or drop it in the Q&A online. Or you can private message people on Hopin. Just ping them on Hopin. Yeah. So our last speaker is a research fellow right here from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute Department of Data Science and Harvard's T.H. Chan Medical School of Public Health Biostatistics. Please welcome Dr. Jill Lundell. Where's the full screen? I'll have to just scroll down, I guess. I guess I don't know why it loaded like that. Well, it's a PDF and not a. All right, sorry. Please bear with me, guys. I'm going to fix this. <laughs> Put it up from the, from the drive specifically. directly. Thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce a bioconductor package that uh, Kelly Street and I created called Cytop QC that has a pretty basic function, which is to clean Cytop data. So Cytop is a technology, it's a single cell technology that allows us to quantify proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids, lipids in single cells. The way it works is that you conjugate heavy metal isotopes to antibodies that then attach to the parts of the cell you're interested in. And each cell goes through the machine one at a time. It's pulverized and then goes through a mass spec. And you can see how much of each of these quantities, these things you're interested in, are in your cell. When you get your data back, it contains different kinds of events. You have single cells, which is the data we're interested in using for downstream analysis. But there's a bunch of other stuff that needs to be removed prior to that analysis, such as calibration beads, debris, cell aggregates, and live or, or and dead cells. Sometimes you want to remove dead cells, sometimes you don't care. Um, the strategy right now is based on flow cytometry because this is a somewhat similar idea. Um, they do a bunch of two by two scatter matrices, they draw gates around them and systematically remove or include cells based on these metrics. Um, there are some problems with gating though. Um, for one, it's very time consuming, it, particularly if you have a lot of data. But in addition to that, you are also, you're limited to two dimensions and it's also not reproducible. If you send the same data to different scientists, they will make different judgment calls on that gating strategy. And then if you need to reproduce it, that can be very difficult as well. Another thing that we found when we started working with this data is most of the people we talk to who are gating the data don't really know what they're doing and they know they don't know what they're doing and they're terrified about it. And um, an expert gator usually does a really good job of cleaning this data. But unfortunately, most of the people doing the cleaning are not expert gators. There's also a big problem that is recognized over and over again in the literature, and that is the deal of uh, the issue of dealing of cleaning out cell doublets. So the idea that they use right now is that um, two cells have a lot more DNA than a single cell. And so one of the metrics you get back is the amount of DNA in the cell. 
So if you have cells with a lot of extra DNA, they'll clean those out as doublets. But this is very problematic because tumor cells also often have a lot of extra DNA. Also, large cells may register as having more DNA. And this is a known problem without, that didn't have a good solution. The project that we were using Cytoff on was on osteosarcoma data, which is highly problematic because it has high ploidy, which means it has a lot of extra DNA. So the biologists we're working with, she had used CRISPR to splice GFP into the, the cancer cells so that when they went through the, two, uh, the Cytoff machine, we knew exactly which cells were tumor cells and which cells were not tumor cells. However, when she looked at her data, all the tumor cells were gone. She said, I, I should have 5,000. I know I have 5,000, but there are 48 left in my data set. I don't know what's happening. Well, she backed up and undid her gating and found that she was gating them all out when gating out doublets. So in that bottom left-hand diagram, that's the actual data set you're seeing where they had all disappeared. And the pink cells are the tumor cells. And as you can see, um, when you use the gate, they are all cleaned out. Of, nearly all of them are cleaned out of the data set. Um, this is the data set I'll be showing for the rest of my talk, just so you know. So um, Kelly and I were obviously very concerned about this and had been for a while. And um, there wasn't a strategy that we could find that worked well. So we went back to find out what was actually happening in the Cytoff machine. So there were a few measurements that come off into the data set that were mysteries. Everybody kind of knew what they were, but nobody knew what to do with them. But we found out that as a cell passes through the Cytoff machine, the voltage is measured as it gets close to the laser and then as it passes through. It's measured about 30 times, and the closer it is to the laser, the stronger it is. Now, in a normal event, that's, those will form a Gaussian curve. So what the Cytoff machine does is it fits a the best fit Gaussian curve through those points. And you get a center offset and width, which define the shape of that Gaussian curve. You also get a residual, which tells you how far the different measurements deviate from that curve. So um, you don't get the individual points, but you do get these four measures at, at every phase. And we found usually they were not being taken into consideration when Cytop data were cleaned. So what happens when you have a doublet pass through? Well you get two peaks. Um, but unfortunately, you know, you, it should be a mixture model that's fit. However, that's not what's fit. What is fit is your best Gaussian curve. So as you can see, that residual is going to be very, very large. So we quickly realized this residual was the key to determining between a large cell and a doublet cell. Because even a cell with a lot of DNA that is a single cell will still follow a somewhat Gaussian curve as it passes through the machine. So what we did is um, we took all the quality data. There is a bunch of quality data that standard, comes standard with Cytop and used it to create UMAPs. We found that these UMAPs separate into the different event types pretty well, um, but it's not a really good standard cleaning strategy. So we use that information to better understand how these metrics pertain to the different events. So we would brush the UMAP and see what happened. So this is an example of a set of doublets. You can see the DNA is really high. The event length is high, the residual is high. You can also see that offset um, center and width are really off from what we would expect to see in a normal cell. Um, however, we did find that's not always the case. Sometimes they're normal. So we used this method on many, many different data sets and were able to get an idea of how these metrics pertain to the different event types. Using these metrics, um, we obtained some simple scores that allow us to see what each event, how much each event looks like each type. So um, for instance, here on the debris score, we see a definite peak over here. We're really sure these blue ones are probably debris. These green ones, we're really sure they're not debris. These purple ones, we're not really sure what these are. So what we do is we take a random selection of data from the green points and a random selection from the blue points, and um, we train a model using all of the quality variables. Now, these scores are not an input. They are just used to select a training data set with labels where we're pretty confident of the results. Um, we have, a, so one of the mo models you can use, there's a few different options, is a support vector machine. This was our natural inclination because it uses hyperplanes to separate groups, which gave us a feel for a gating procedure. So we thought of it as a high dimensional, high dimensional reproducible gating procedure. Um, and so uh, 
anyway, so that's one of the options. The other one is gradient boosting machines or random forests. And once again, that tree structure had a similar feel to gating, but instead of looking at two variables at a time, you can look at all the variables at the same time. So how does this actually work? So um, the top row, that would be a standard scatter plot used as a gating procedure. So this particular plot, as you can see, th these points would be the ones that would be retained as singlets and everything else would be thrown out from a regular gating procedure. The red points over here, these are the tumor cells. As you can see, they would be removed, which is what had happened. Um, down here, we, I have DNA and GFP, so, um, and I removed the debris because that's an easy thing to usually identify. And as you can see, these are the tumor cells. Once again, they are removed. You can see them here as well. But how does Cytoph QC do? So in Cytoph QC, we label the data, and these points are labeled as debris. These points are labeled as normal cells that should be retained, and these points are the doublets. As you can see, the tumor cells are largely retained and not counted as doublets. Um, down here, the green cells, these are non-tumor cells. The pink points, those are tumor cells. And the dark points are the ones that were labeled as doublets. So as you can see, we do have some doublets in the tumor cells. We would expect to see some doublets in the tumor cells, but the vast majority of the tumor cells are not classified as doublets. So um, Cytop QC, has been, it is available on Bioconductor. I got some great data from my collaborator about a month ago, so I've been reworking it. The new version is even cleaner than the original. The original one does work well, and it is available right now on my GitHub. Um, and the, the new one will be pushed to Bioconductor in the next few days. I'm just kind of looking at the documentation for typos right now. But um, the great thing about Cytop QC is we try to be very mindful of our audience. You can do all of this in one function if you have no clue what you're doing, and it'll do a pretty good job. It labels your data and gives other metrics that allow you to um, make informed decisions about your data and what you do and don't want to keep. Um, but also, all the different parts are fully customizable and can be put together in a way that a researcher or a data user is interested in. So um, someone who understands our data very well can use the information available in this package to really highly customize their cleaning method. So it, it has everything in between. Um, Anyway, so hopefully if you're using Cytoff data, you uh, take a look at our package. It's, like I said, pretty easy to use. And uh, thank you. I'm also terrible about putting acknowledgments, so I did want to acknowledge Rafa for his help on this work and the Crompton Lab, which we've been working with to get the Cytoff data, and Kelly Street, of course, who is my collaborator on this. Oh, yes. Thank you. Very nice work. Um, I was curious um, because there was one point where you showed the um, quality, I think it was the, the combination score, um, where you could separate out very well the populations, and I think it was this slide, but then the things in the middle. Um, I've done something similar in bits and pieces, and it seemed to be that cells that were not in as great shape from a given experiment kind of ended up blurring my UMAP lines of clusters. I'm curious, um, have you tested it with beyond other data sets to see how different processing may affect? Yeah, so we've actually, um, in fact, we have some data that's not even that great as our biologist was learning how to use the machine. And it is messier and a little harder to see things, but we still get pretty pretty good results. But definitely, that. But one reason why I redid this is they, they finally nailed it down, so we were able to nail down the method better. But yeah, you'll see some muddying if the data quality isn't as good. The customizable part definitely helps, though. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll just, uh, if, it, if there's no question, I'll just do a comment. Um, I think this is a desperately needed package, so thank you so much for doing this. Um, I was at the CITO 2023 conference in Montreal this year. There's lots of different approaches for this for flow. You know, Sophie's got all those great packages, but we desperately need something for Cytoff. And seeing this, I was really excited. I'm going to definitely share this on Twitter to all my uh, Cytometry people. So good job. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. That concludes this session. Um, you have a little bit of time to run to your next sessions and grab a snack, grab some coffee, and we'll see you all after.